So I want to begin uh, as we look at Psalm 27 this way. Uh, when I was a, a student at Oxford, I did my uh, doctoral work there in historical theology, and I studied as often as I could in the Duke Humphreys Library. I think we have a, a shot of that library uh, for the screen. It's a sort of intellectual time capsule, uh, books, maps, manuscripts, pretty much the way they were in the middle of the 17th century. If you wanted to know the sum of human knowledge circa 1640, uh, there, this is maybe the best place in the world uh, to go. It's not surprising that uh, C.S. Lewis, when he studied and taught in Oxford, this also was his favorite library to go to. But it wasn't just for the old books. It was also for the beautiful, ornate ceiling. And while he was sitting at one of the long wooden desks, Lewis could look up and see the university's ancient motto. I think we have a slide of this as well, written on an open Bible decorated with three crowns for the triune God, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, which means the Lord is my light. Now that, that centuries old motto comes from the opening verse of today's Psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? And I, I sometimes, as I was sitting there, would look up and I would meditate on that motto, hopefully the way you think about from time to time for Christ and his kingdom. What does that mean for me? What are the implications? And as a follower of Christ, I understood that uh, I really understood the foundation of the, the founding purpose of Oxford University, the true basis for all knowledge, that the true light is Jesus Christ. Everything we could ever know comes ultimately from him as creator and savior. But I have to admit that I didn't always think about Dominus Illuminatio Mea in the full context of Psalm 27 and the life of David and the story of salvation. What helped me to do that was gospel music, black gospel music from the campus of Wheaton College. You see, my little sister Nancy was in the gospel choir Sister Tanya remembers her. I know she does. Uh, and in 1994, my sister sent me for Christmas a recording of the fall concert. Uh, this was back in the, uh, the early days. Uh, you had music on cassette tape. It might have been, it might have been the uh, Gospel Choir's first release. But back in those days, um, really most of the gospel music that I had encountered was in the movies. Uh, now I had something I could listen to every day, and I just about wore that recording out. And one of the songs on that uh, that was part of that concert is a song that the gospel choir will sing uh, for us before the end of chapel today, based on Psalm 27. And it really opened up for me the psalm in a deeper way. And I just want to uh, reinforce the things that, that Aaron, uh, that Austin said. This is the value of sharing community and learning worship traditions across the body of Christ. It's the value of Rhythm and Praise Chapel if gospel music isn't part of your church tradition the way it wasn't a part of mine. You will hear something new or maybe something old in a fresh way that deepens your experience of Jesus Christ. I hope you make the most of that opportunity through the speakers and musicians we have in chapel, through the local churches that you're intentional about visiting and perhaps joining, uh, through the things that your classmates can teach you that you could never learn if all you ever did was worship with people from your particular body part in the body of Christ. There are things I learned from Psalm 27 in gospel music that I couldn't learn just looking at the ceiling of a library in Oxford. The gospel choir gave me a soundtrack for David's song. It showed me that Psalm 27 was really a celebration song. It just wasn't just about receiving the light of God's truth. It was also about triumphing over enemies in the strength of God's power and then making a melody about it. And it wasn't just for a solitary believer, although it's written from a personal perspective, it's like all of the Psalms, it's something to sing with a wider community and you have to hear those voices to experience that and understand it. I love what happens when we encounter other Christian traditions grounded in the word of God 
We don't have to take anything away from what we love or what we can bring. It's not us versus them. It's a win-win. And when we add the gifts of others to gain a fuller understanding of God's word, we have a stronger connection to the worldwide body of Christ and a deeper experience of the triune God. Now, all of that is a good place to start, but I have a few other things I want to share from Psalm 27. Uh, I want you to see that this psalm has two different moods. In fact, some critics have wondered whether it's really two psalms somehow stitched together. You can see what you think. I think the whole thing fits together. It's just that sometimes we have mixed emotions. You don't just have one feeling at one time. Sometimes you have more than one. And David had a very rich emotional life. He experienced that a lot. You see that here in Psalm 27, particularly if you have your Bible in front of you, and look more closely. Verses 1 to 6, David is brimming with confidence. God is his light and his salvation. He's not afraid of anyone or anything, even when people are hunting him down like a pack of wild animals. When he's a man under siege with a whole army camped around him, he is not afraid one little bit. He, he knows that God will hide him in a shelter and lift him up on a mighty rock. And maybe you have some moments like that too. When no matter what is happening, you are surprisingly confident that God will deliver you. What you need, it will be provided. Where you are wounded, it will be healed. What seems lost, it will be found. What you fear, it will be conquered. You, you believe this, you know this, and so you are able to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I will not be afraid. Now, when David had those feelings, he wanted to worship. Verse 4 in this psalm, one of the most exalted verses in the Bible for expressing a heart's purest and highest desire for the worship of God. One thing have I asked of the Lord, David said. This is the only thing I want. Here's my desire, to live in the house of the Lord for the rest of my life so that I can see the beauty of God. He's talking about going to the tabernacle, the best place he knows for getting close to God. Last week, I read about a Scottish minister. We can learn from Scottish people, too, bagpipes and all, who, uh, who sat at the bedside of one of his parishioners. And this poor woman had lost both her husband and her only son, and now she herself seemed to be near to death. The minister knew very well of this family's faith in Christ, and so he wanted to encourage this woman with happy thoughts of heaven. Soon you will see them both, he said, to which the woman responded, Jesus first. Is that the way it is for you, Jesus first? Or at least, is that the way you want it to be? That's the way it was for David. Seeing his Savior was his highest joy in earthly life and the focus of his heavenly hope. But now, remember I said David had mixed emotions. And as we come to verse 7, the psalm takes a serious turn. This same believer, so confident in God with all of these things to sing about, suddenly doubts whether God is really there at all. Have you ever felt this way? I know you have, because I think everyone does. It's one of the things that's so well reflected in the traditions of black gospel music, both the heights of celebration and exaltation and also the depths of lamentation and mourning. There are times when you feel totally alone, when you wonder if God is listening or if he even cares at all. And, and that's the way it was for David. His prayers here, I think, become rather desperate. He, he turns in verse 7. He was speaking about the Lord, and now he speaks directly to the Lord, and he is crying out for answers. God said to him, seek my face. That's in verse 8. And David insisted that he did seek God's face. That's what he wanted more than anything else in life. But... God seemed so far away that David had to plead with him. 
Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. Cast me not off. Forsake me not. He, he describes in verse 10 the way that he feels like a motherless child. He hopes that God will save him, but, but it hasn't happened yet, and so he is crying out to God. I wonder if you have had some of those feelings, a longing to be accepted, a need to be protected, a hope to be heard, a request for guidance. See, Psalm 27 also puts all of those sad and sometimes anxious feelings into words, words of prayer that God would love to answer. So where does David end up? How does he live with these mixed emotions of deep confidence in God and desperate concern that his prayers might go unanswered? We get the answer in the final verse where David says, wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. See, this is the best thing to do whenever you feel really desperate and wish that God would just hurry up and solve your problems. The best thing to do is wait in faith to see what God will do. And I think even the way David writes this verse helps us learn that lesson. He tells us to wait and then he tells us to wait again. There's an intentional repetition that slows us down. Wait for it, wait for it. That's, that's what David is communicating here. And if we do that, eventually we will discover that it was worth the wait because God knew what he was doing all along. I want to illustrate this patient courage from the ministry of Francis Grimke. As soon as I started thinking about Psalm 27 in the light of Rhythm and Praise Chapel, I said to myself, I bet there is something good on Psalm 27 in Francis Grimke. Now, uh, you probably don't know Francis Grimke, which is too bad. Uh, there's still time to learn, though. Uh, he was born a slave in Charleston, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina. He faced um, many challenging hardships before finally becoming a free man after the Civil War. He went to the North for an education. Like a lot of college students, he started out pre-med and then changed his major. <laughs> Uh, after college, he got a law degree at Howard University. Then he was called into the ministry, and for 60 years, he led the 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. Had a notable ministry as a Bible teacher, also helped to found the NAACP. Well, as it turns out, uh, my little instinct turned out to be right because Grimke uh, preached four sermons on Psalm 27, specifically on this final verse, verse 14. I want, to hear, I want you to hear just a few of his words again this morning. And uh, we're going to go a little bit past 1120. You know, this is gospel worship this morning. We can go long. Is that right? In Detroit, Highlands Church in Detroit, Austin. Uh, in the year 1898, Grimke was trying to help his community respond to awful events that had taken place in Wilmington, North Carolina, and had really struck terror into black communities across the country. White supremacists in that community had attacked uh, black members of the community. They had dragged them from their homes. They had beat them. They had killed many of them, uncertain exactly how many, and they had driven the rest of them out of town without any expectation of justice. And as Grimke went to his congregation that following Sunday, it was tempting to give up. He, in fact, began his sermon by acknowledging his sense of hopelessness, despondency, he called it, that, that feeling that there is no use continuing the struggle. And then he started to list some of the reasons why. He was grieved by the loss of black lives. He was discouraged by the unfriendliness, not only of the South, but also of the North, by a spirit of lawlessness in the country, people just doing whatever they wanted to do, discouraged by the silence of the church. But he wanted his congregation to know that in spite of all discouragements, he had not lost his faith in what God could do. He could see light coming in darkness. And so he turned to Psalm 27, wait on the Lord. Be strong, take courage, wait on the Lord. He didn't mean by this that people should just sit back and do nothing. Of course, they should fight for justice. And he was living that out, not only in his ministry, but in his involvement nationally. But he also believed that waiting on God was the foundation of all true Christian hope. 
Grimke looked at the problems of the nation. He saw no hope in the power of government, no true influence from any political party, but he found his help, hope elsewhere in the dominion of a great being without beginning of days or end of years, who knows all things, who has all power and who is infinite in justice. He found his hope in the God who holds the scepter of universal empire. I'm using some of his language here. He also found hope in the mighty power of prayer, which he believed to be one of the mightiest forces in the universe. Through prayer, definite results may be accomplished. And he pointed out that just as the cries of hearts bleeding under slavery had once led to emancipation, he imagined slaves all over the South praying in the fields, praying in their cabins for deliverance from captivity. So also the prayers of spirits now despondent would lead to reconciliation. I am hopeful, he preached, because I have faith in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to conquer all prejudices, to break down all walls of separation, and to weld together people of all races into one great brotherhood. That's a good message for us today and every day. Are you weary of waiting, waiting for God to satisfy some deep desire to heal your wounded heart? Is there a prayer for our campus community, for this nation, for our world in all of its need that you keep hoping God will answer? And sometimes it's tempting to give up hope. Don't give up. The Savior who loves you, who died for you, will come again to you in all of the power of his grace. As you work for the kingdom, look for the light of your salvation. Be strong, take courage, and wait for the Lord.